Thanks for joining our webinar today, Outdoor Renovation Rx, Getting Light at Night Right. My name is Holly English and I'll be your moderator. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Across the bottom of your screen, you should see several buttons that are your dashboard. Hover your cursor over the buttons to to see what each does. Click on the Q&A button to type a question at any time. We will answer as many of these as we can in the time left at the end of the presentation. Next is the speaker biography button. Click on this button to show the speaker bio or minimize that button from your screen. The certification button allows you to see your progress toward earning a certificate for one CEU credit. Stay with us for at least 50 minutes of this webinar and answer all of the polling questions to earn your certificate of completion. Be sure to print your certificate at the end of the webinar yourself. Pay special attention to the survey button. We need your input to make these presentations even more useful to you. So please bring up the survey on your screen at the end of the webinar and answer the questions before you leave us today. And finally, the button with the question mark is your on-screen help. This webinar is being recorded and we'll email a link to you. So let's get started. Our presenter today brings a wealth of lighting experience. Eric Gibson is the Director for Commercial Outdoor Products at Acuity Brands Lighting. Eric received his BS degree in Illumination Engineering at the University of Colorado and his MBA at Mercer University in Atlanta. Eric has been working in the lighting industry for 29 years with numerous manufacturers and has been at Acuity since 2000. He has been a member of the Illuminating Engineering Society since 1988 with involvement in several different committees including the Model Lighting Ordinance and is currently a member of the Environmental Outdoor Committee. It's all yours, Eric. All right, thank you. Uh, with that said, let's go ahead and get started. As we go through the presentation today, what I'd like to do is talk firstly, uh, initially about the uh, confidentiality statement. This is a, a confidential uh, presentation, but one that you are welcome to uh, use at your, uh, as long as you can remember it. Now, as we go through the agenda, uh, a couple items I wanted to discuss, first of all, is that healthcare is a unique and, uh, and very special type of an arrangement where you're looking at applications that do not necessarily occur in other areas. We'll discuss that briefly, along with what makes outdoor lighting so important. Secondly, it's important to note what makes LED lighting so special and what should you look for in an LED product. For example, how much light do you need and how do you light your specific hospital? And lastly, I'd like to finish with some application photographs showing some other hospitals that we've been working with in the past. Now, before we get too far in, uh, one thing we would like to know is how many people are in the room with you? A lot of folks are using this uh, lunchtime as an opportunity to have a lunch and learn. So if there are more than one person in the room, please make sure you put in the number of people with you. If you are by yourself, just type in one and then hit submit. All right, <clears throat> to get started here, first let's talk about a few of the design considerations for healthcare. Healthcare facilities are very unique. This is not like your standard business where people go in day in and day out you have people coming and going at all hours, uh, regardless of it's day or night. You also have a large number of people that are coming with very preoccupied minds. You have people that have their own health or the health of loved ones on their mind, and they're probably not very familiar with the environment of the hospital. So it's important that we help these people navigate to the correct locations. As we go through and look at specific design considerations, one of which is going to be that lighting itself can serve as a beacon to help direct people to the correct entrances and correct locations, whether it be in an emergency or whether it be a visitor coming to uh, attend to a, a loved one or even someone that works at the hospital. An employee, they often have to walk through dark areas of parking lots late at night. So it's important to realize that regardless of what healthcare facility you're looking at, there are a number of key factors that we all have in common. First of all, you want your facility to look safe, comforting, and inviting. 
Now, as we go through it, uh, I'd like to get one quick polling question for you. Many of us have different ideals of what makes a, an ideal lighting assessment. So what I would like to get from you is your opinion, what is the primary value for outdoor lighting on a healthcare campus? Is it safety? Is it the security? Is it wayfinding, aesthetics, or is it all of them? I'll give you guys just a few minutes to go ahead and key in that information. All right, and let's go to wrap that up. What we're finding is that the primary value is all of them. An overwhelming amount of you chose that every single one of those elements is important to the lighting design. So in looking at that, let's go through and address these items one at a time. First, why outdoor lighting? Why is outdoor lighting so important? I know that for most of you, when doing a lighting retrofit project, your focus is typically on the interior spaces, but the outdoor is also equally important because this is the entryway to your facility. So it's important to identify, first of all, what do we need for safety? What do we need for security? What do we need for wayfinding? And what do we need from an aesthetic perspective? Now, first of all, one item that is often very confusing is that safety and security are often used interchangeably. It's going to be important for us to identify these, so I'm going to hit them real quick up front. First, the difference between safety and security. Safety is defined as protecting people from injury. This is going to include creating safe working conditions, safe passageways, easy identification of hazards or obstructions. This, in essence, allows someone to navigate through a parking lot without running into a car, falling into a pothole, tripping over a curb, etc. Security, on the other hand, is about protecting people and property from criminal activities. This is a very different task and requires different lighting, so we will address these separately. First, let's talk about safety. One of the biggest safety issues is trip and fall hazards. These can easily be mitigated as long as there's appropriate lighting in the area. As you can see in the top picture, this was a sidewalk that had a curb that at one time was painted a nice bright yellow, but it now has been overpainted with red, making it almost impossible to see under most evening conditions. Now, the other items that can be very important are hidden objects. These might include fences or broken curbs or things of that nature, where it's very important to identify the vertical element that people might be encountering as they transverse through a parking lot. Now, there is not just the physical items of tripping and falling. There are other items such as the actual color. If you look at the uh, photographs here, you'll see in the top one that that curb that was painted yellow, obviously for safety reasons, is completely indistinguishable from the rest of the sidewalk there. So obviously color of the light is going to have an impact on what the person sees as they walk through that space. If you want to identify a potentially dangerous situation, such as walking out into a street area, then you would want that to be certainly noticeable by the occupants. Now, safety is a big part of what we want to do at a hospital. No one wants to get hurt at the hospital. But at the same time, we also need to be advised about security. So as we look at security, there's a couple of key elements we need to look at. First of all, I put a statement up there that says lighting alone will not deter nor displace criminal activity. In fact, proper lighting without any other effects would in a sense make it easier because now the criminals could see what they were doing. In fact, one thing that I've never ever heard is, hey, gee, look at that well-lit parking lot. I guess I can't break in, so I better go get a job. So I know I'm taking a little bit of a lighthearted step there, but really what it comes down to is that to effectively deter crime, you need to do just three things. 
The first is you need to increase the time needed to perform a criminal act and then to escape. You need to increase the probability of detection and increase the probability of apprehension. Any of those items will in effect increase the security of a space. Now, how does light fall into that? Well, light alone does not mean better security. In fact, there have been no studies that have implicitly linked higher levels of light to higher levels of security. The reason that these studies have not been able to effectively do this is because when you produce extra light in a space, it feels safer, and when it feels safer, you have additional people there. When you have additional people there, that means that you have a higher probability of detection and a higher probability of apprehension. So there's a lot of noise that comes in because the perception of security is really what drives the reality when it comes to lighting for security. So in order to provide lighting for the perception of security, there's really three key items that we need to look at. First of all, it is important to note that it does need more light than just lighting for safety. It's one thing to have enough light to be able to avoid stepping in a, uh, a pothole. It's something different from being able to examine the intent on somebody's face as they're walking towards you across a parking lot. So in order to see a person's facial recognition or facial expressions, in order to try and derive what their potential intent is, it's important that we have vertical foot candles to properly illuminate their face. That also needs to happen at greater distances. It doesn't help anybody if you have to get within five feet of somebody before you realize that they're trying to steal your purse. So with that in mind, looking at security, there are some other elements that play into it as well. Many hospitals these days have surveillance cameras. And Surveillance cameras can increase the probability of detection, which is one of the keys to improving security. However, for cameras, the amount of light is really almost inconsequential compared to the uniformity of that light. If you look on the bottom photographs there, on the left you'll see a metal halide lit parking lot, and you'll see it looks very, very dark. That same night, this uh, at the exact same time, an adjoining lot was lit with LED. And you can see the security camera there having a far better image. In fact, the light levels on the LED side are actually lower than the metal halide, but the cameras have such a limited dynamic range compared to the human eye that they cannot show very large contrast ratios between very bright and very dark areas, which is very common with metal halide. In fact, if you go back to the metal halide slide, you probably did not even notice that there is right there in the middle of the image, a car. So you could get attacked in the middle of the parking lot, right in the middle of the view of the camera, and no one would ever know. Now, another important element besides safety and security is going to be wayfinding. Wayfinding allows you to navigate your way from your entryway of the parking lot all the way through to your final destination. There's really three elements to wayfinding. The first key to success is going to be to illuminate where you are. This means in the parking lot, once a person enters, parks the car and gets out, how do they navigate from that location to a path that is going to direct them onward to their, uh, their final destination? The second thing that's important is going to be to illuminate where you're going. The occupant comfort increases when the destination is lit, such as a lighthouse or a homing beacon can direct people where to go. This is particularly important in cases of emergencies where people are looking for any visual cues to direct them where to go. The third important item in wayfinding is going to be to illuminate the path to get there. Now, this is typically going to be lower levels of light, only required for safety, that are sufficient to lead you to your destination without tripping over a bump on the sidewalk. Now, the fourth item to discuss as far as applications is going to be the aesthetics of floodlighting. 
Flood lighting is how a person can create that homing beacon effect on the, on the side of the building. If we look here on this example, you can see that there's a number of different ways to illuminate a side of a building. Flood lighting can come in a number of different ways, one of which is N-grade, which means most of the product is actually underground and then can be walked on, or above grade. And if above grade, it would be mounted on a stake or some type of mounting device, even a pole, that could be used to illuminate the facade. So the type of flood lighting is going to be important because in cases of the front of a hospital, where you will have a number of people walking around, you would not want to have something protruding above the ground because that would, in essence, just create an additional trip hazard. Another important element is going to be the distribution choice. These are important, especially if you have key items to try and illuminate. For example, if you were to try and illuminate those columns, it would be important to have a very narrow distribution as opposed to a very wide distribution used on a, uh, a large blank wall. Now, one other element that is nice when it comes to aesthetics of flood lighting is that it does not all have to be white light. You can find that color can be used as an accent to architecture. Now, typically, it's not going to be as dramatic as what I'm showing here. However, it is an important element that should not be overlooked. Now, when it comes to flood lighting, there's a couple of key best practices that need to be attended to. First of all, keep in mind the maintenance issues. For example, that bridge, though very beautiful with that illumination, those floodlights underneath, if you were the maintenance person, I believe you would dread having to go out there and replace those lamps by putting your stepladder upon a rowboat and toting out there under the bridge to try and change those lamps. Similarly, you need almost a Spider-Man to help with the uh, facade lighting there on the front of that building with the lights all the way up 40, 50, 60 feet in the air. So overall, it becomes a cost of ownership solution. In other words, you need to define what you're willing to do, how much light you need, where you need to place that light, and then assess what is required to maintain that light. So before I go any further, I just wanted to uh, get another bit of polling here. I wanted to know what is the most important difference, in your opinion, between conventional metal halide sources and LED lighting? In other words, what are the main benefits of LED lighting? Is it energy efficiency? Is it a uniform distribution? Is it color rendering? Or is it useful life and lumen maintenance? I'll give everybody just a couple of minutes to go ahead and uh, key in their answers. Looks like we have a fairly uh, good distribution so far. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and proceed. The responses that I think you'll find interesting is almost equally divided amongst energy efficiency, uniform distribution, and useful life or lumen maintenance. These are all very, very important, both from a financial as well as a safety, consider excuse me, safety consideration. Now, if we go in and look in detail about really what makes LED different, it's important to understand that these are different sources and that they actually have very, very different effects once you start looking at how they act in the space. So with LED, it's important to note that 100% of the light can be controlled. In other words, every bit of light that leaves that LED is going to be going through an optical assembly that can then direct that light exactly where it needs to go. It sounds pretty obvious, but you might not have realized that with old metal halide sources, that was not the case. In fact, a full 30% of the light went straight out the bottom of that luminaire, and we had no opportunity to redirect that light in most cases. So LEDs also have much longer useful lives, which are going to minimize the maintenance. Instead of replacing a metal halide lamp every three years, with LEDs, you're expecting those to last upwards of even 20 years in some cases. Color is more consistent both between individual products, but also it stays the same over the course of its life, 
I'll show you some photos later which will show how metal halide does not behave in that same fashion. Now it used to be that cost was a tremendous factor, but now you'll find many LED products can cost the same and in some cases are even less expensive than HID. Now LEDs can save over 75% of your energy bill. This is probably one of the most commonly recognized items, but it's important to realize that that is a huge amount of energy saved over the course of the year. LEDs also love to be dimmed, which saves even more money. It's very difficult and challenging to uh, properly control a metal halide or high pressure sodium type of a source. But when it comes to LEDs, I think that you would be giving yourself a misservice if you did not include controls in your offering. Now, I've got a slide here that kind of shows the comparison of what happens to a metal halide versus what happens to an LED. On the left-hand side, you can see that large yellow bar which starts at 36,000 lumens. That's the amount of light that an initial brand new lamp is going to be producing. Now, simply by orienting that lamp sideways, you will find that that light output typically might drop from 36,000 lumens to around 32,000 lumens. It's a pretty significant drop. That's that first red bar. Now, that's only on day one. Over the course of the three years that, la that that lamp is going to exist, you will be losing light. The industry has accepted what's called mean lumens, which indicates about where the light level would be, about 40% into that lamp's life. So over the first 40% of that lamp's life, you would see the entirety of that red bar, that first big red bar right there, that would be dropping your light levels after only 9,000 hours of use. The remaining 60% of that lamp's life would be below that red line going all the way down close to 15 or 16,000 lumens. So we're going to assume that we're using the mean lumens here, and then we're going to take that lamp and put it into a metal halide luminaire. Once we put it inside a luminaire, you will find there's additional losses, such as losses incurred from redirecting that light on the reflectors, as well as losses incurred as it projects through that glass lens. So the effective use of that metal halide, a 400 watt metal halide, is going to be about 16,800 lumens. It's a far cry from the 36,000 lumens that we first started with. But now if we look at an LED solution, which is on the right hand side, our initial lumens for a comparable product might be even less than 22,000 lumens. The example here I show is 21,900 lumens but the orientation of those don't matter, so there's no losses incurred in that first little red step on the LED side. When it comes to mean lumens, we have to think a little bit about what the intent of mean lumens is. It's the amount of light that is the average over the course of that luminaire's life. This is the design of lumens that we're looking for. And what we'll see is that LEDs, even with their long life of over 100,000 hours, if we take the light output at about halfway through that, we are looking at that tiny middle bar on the right, which means after 50,000 hours, you're losing only a small portion. And then lastly, the luminaire efficiency. When we consider the amount of lumens that come out of an LED luminaire, we use something called, uh, we and the industry overall, use something called absolute photometry. This is different from the photometry that we used to use that was required for the variability of the metal halide sources. Now what we'll do is we'll take the entire luminaire in so any losses incurred due to the lenses and other heat losses, any of those losses are actually counted in on the initial 21,900 lumens. So we're not needing to take out that same number again, so we result with 21,000 lumens which is more than the metal halide did. But what's interesting, if on day one on a brand new metal halide source and a brand new LED source, the LED actually produces less light than the metal halide. And it will continue to produce less light for up to the first six or eight months. But then for the next 23 and a half years, you would find the LED producing more light. 
So it's important to pay attention not only to how much light you're producing, but over the what course of time are you trying to get this measurement. So to put this more into perspective in terms of lamp life, let's look a little bit more detail about what happens to the metal halide source. Metal halide starts at 100% output, and it drops down over the course of its rated life to about 55% of its initial output. This is what we've been happy with for the last 25 years. And in putting this into a chart, uh, first of all, it's important to remember that that 100 represents 100% 100 of the lamp life, which is only 15,000 hours, so less than three and a half years. So if I put this into the chart similar to what you would find with an LED chart, you would see that the 100% initial light output drops to 55% output after 15,000 hours. So it's still producing 55%, it lost 45% of its light. Now, LED products that we were producing about seven years ago had a longevity curve of L70 at 50,000 hours. That means it only lost 30% of its life over the course of 11 and a half years, or about 50,000 hours of nighttime use. Now, a lot of people are familiar with L70. L70 is that line, that dotted line, which represents the point at which the industry suggests replacing any type of LED source. So five or seven years ago, the expected life of a product might have been only on the order of 10 years, 10, 11 years. But the products that we use today are going to last significantly longer. Now, one big change between the LED, the purple line, and the HID, which is the blue line, is that the blue line stops because those lamps burn out. But LEDs don't necessarily just burn out. They just keep getting dimmer and dimmer as they age. Now, as we look at this, we'd have to consider that to be a product that would want to be rep uh, replaced after about 10 years. The products that we use today are that red line that you see at the top. That represents L99 at 100,000 hours. That means over the course of 22 and a half years of nighttime use, you're losing about 1% of your initial output. It becomes quite obvious now that the LEDs are not the part that's going to be the first ones to fail. In fact, typically it becomes the driver, which is why all of our charts end at 100,000 hours, which is the rated life for most of the drivers that we use. Now, one thing that's interesting, and that is, if I were to try and reduce the price of this product, I could do that by using the same number of LEDs, but driving them a little bit harder. If I drive them a little bit harder, you'll result in this green line. The lumen maintenance drops slightly. However, now I can save up to 20 or 25 percent on the luminaire cost. So you will see most manufacturers that are able to manage that heat and the thermals on our luminaires correctly, most of them are going to be increasing the drive current to a point where the luminaires become very affordable and yet still produce all the appropriate light and have the lumen maintenance required to last as long as we need to last. Now, this is an interesting concept, but one thing that's important is to understand really what uniformity means, because uniformity is what you're going to see on your site. Now, I just have a, a, a simple parking lot drawn there. Now, a uniform site lit with LEDs might look something like this. Now, to give you a decoding of the colors, you'd see the light blue is actually one foot candle, the light green is two foot candles, and the dark green is three foot candles. Now, in this particular case, we are slightly over 2.2 foot candles on an average with a minimum of one foot candle anywhere on that site. We also have very little spill light off to the adjoining areas. If we light that in that exact same lot with a one-for-one -one replacement, if we were using metal halide, it would look something like this. All of those yellow, orange, and particularly the red areas, which represent over 25 foot candles, 
are simply an enormous amount of wasted light energy directly underneath the poles. Yet still, in between each one of those poles, I still have those blue areas, which represent only one minimum foot candle. So the minimums are the same on these two layouts, even though the LED can get by with much less light simply through the use of better uniformity. Now, let's not just look at these colorized renderings. Let's look at some real pictures, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. This right here is an example parking lot. It uses twin 250-watt metal halide luminaires, each one consuming about 295 watts once you consider the ballast. You'll notice that there's a significant amount of light directly underneath the luminaire, and it starts to fall off as you get further between the luminaires. Now, in this particular case, we took a 50% energy reduction, dropping it from 295 watts down to 144 watts. Once we'd cut the energy in half and did a one-for-one -one replacement, the resulting layout looked like this. In fact, all of a sudden, we had people at this facility complaining to us that suddenly they were uh, thinking we overlit the parking lot and actually were consuming too much energy, uh, which is quite funny. But we did, in this particular example, uh, have the foresight to put in some motion sensors. So this 144 watt is actually going to be the brightest that we're looking at, with it dropping down to only 64 watts. Now, as you see here on the right, that 64 watt layout has the exact same uniformity as the 144 watts, which is different from what happens with metal halide. So in this case, we were incurring a 78% energy savings for that site, and not only did it have an improvement over the 144 watts, or with 144 watts, when you compared the 64 watts to the initial 300 watt input, people found even in that case, the new 64 watt input with 78% energy savings produced better quality lighting and more uniform lighting in their space. So to kind of summarize this uh, story of uniformity is to indicate that there's two different ways that you can measure your light. One is to require a certain minimum foot candle, which is a good idea that gives you your minimum foot candle level required for safety and for security. In that case, you can get by with significantly lower lumens. For example, from instead of 17,000 lumens, you're able to drop down to 11,000 lumens. Now, on the other side, many of you are accustomed to requiring an average foot candle. Average foot candles were great in the days of metal halide. They needed that because of the huge variability in the light output of the metal halide lamps. In this particular case, it's important to note that with equal light solution, in other words, using the same average foot candles, your minimum foot candle is three times larger than it would have been with an HID source, which is really important to realize that you've overlit your site almost three times the amount is necessary simply because of the heritage of the average foot candles. So my recommendation would be to any of you doing designs, to always recommend a minimum foot candle level, in other words, the point at which no point will be darker than that, as opposed to utilizing an average foot candle over the site. So to look a little bit closer at the design considerations for healthcare, there's really a lot to consider. First, you need to consider the areas that need to be illuminated. I'm sure it's not just your parking lot. You likely have a covered parking garage area, you have employee entrances, you've got visitor entrances, you have building facades, pathways, things of that nature. You also need to identify how much light do you want or even need to feel safe in that area. Now there's a lot of places that can help you with that. There's recommendations from the IES, which is the Illumination Engineering Society. There are local requirements that sometimes take precedence. And then of course there's designer preferences where certain areas need certain areas to fit the space that they're working with. Now there are additional considerations such as what is the color of the light? If you had used either metal halide or high pressure sodium, you only had one choice. 
But with LEDs, you can choose almost any color you want. So it's very important to identify what it is you're trying to accomplish, how much light you need, what you're lighting, and what colors should the light be. Lastly, I would I highly recommend that you consider a very uniform site to be a key determining factor of success. Now there's a lot of stuff here, and I realize that I've been in the industry a long time. Uh, some of you guys have been doing many things other than lighting, so I'd like to uh, suggest that we can help with this. There's a huge number of resources that we have available that can help you with your initial layouts. We've got networks of local people that can assist you in many different ways. So on the next slide, what I'd like to do is just um, uh, determine if you would like to get a free lighting assessment on your outdoor environment. Um, just select yes or no, and then go ahead and click submit. We're not going to be showing the results here, so go ahead and feel, uh, feel free to put in your correct answer. And then while we're waiting for this to process through, I will show you one other um, uh, interesting site. The, the next slide is going to be a parking garage, which I know most of us consider parking garages to be rather utilitarian. But here, as we go and look at the Tishman Spayer site, you'll see that even a parking garage with uniform lighting, appropriate light levels can look astonishing. So what do we need to do? Let's say you're trying to illuminate or relight your healthcare facility. What should you be looking for? Here's a couple of key items. First of all, you need to look for a manufacturer that you can trust. There's a huge number of new folks into the LED luminaire industry. Many of them have a very short tenure. Many of them will not be here in another 10 years. So find a manufacturer that you can trust and one that has been working in this industry for a very long time. Second of all, make sure you select products that are accompanied with a wide assortment of lighting controls. Lighting controls are going to be the number one way to manage your lighting load in the future. Now you need to also consider optics. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about the uniformity of sites. Um, there's only some luminaires that actually can leverage that and produce the optics that give you that great uniformity. In other words, just because they're LEDs do not, does not mean that it will be uniform. There's also a lot of optical distributions to choose from. With LEDs, I can shape that light to be exactly where I want it to go. So it's important to figure out where you want that light to be, but also where you don't want that light to be. The last item there is to find luminaires that have very sophisticated light trespass solutions. Considering that you have people staying at these hospitals overnight, they don't want light blaring in through the, through the window, disrupting their sleep. They also don't want neighbors being very upset because a lot of these healthcare facilities are located very near to residential areas. Now, some other things you need to look for besides these. You need to make sure you look for luminaires that have drivers that you recognize. LEDs are no longer the first component that fails, so you need to look for quality drivers. This is the device that actually controls the LEDs. Now, not LEDs are created equal, so you need to make sure you look for LEDs from companies that you recognize. Lumen maintenance. My recommendation is to get at least L90 at 50,000 hours. This is important to make sure that your products are going to last the recommended 20, uh, 20 years of use. And from a more functional perspective, I would recommend a reasonable lead time for these custom-built products of maybe two to three weeks. You certainly don't want to have to wait a month or two months for any type of product that you don't have to. And lastly, make sure that you've got a five-year warranty from a reputable company. Again, the warranty is only as valuable as the company that it's attached to. Now, a couple of photographs I wanted to show you. First of all, this is a site that was part way, uh, this photograph was taken part way through a relight. So in talking about uniformity, if you look on the right hand side, you can see the metal halide, very, very non-uniform. You'll see very bright and yet very dark spaces. You'll see different shades of greens and blues. Whereas on the left hand side, after they've gone through and started the retrofit, 
you can see that the LED side is completely uniform, completely monochromatic, and feels much safer to the occupants in the space. Now, what else should you look for? Well, there's things like light trespass. I spoke about this, but let's show you what I'm talking about. On the left, this might be a standard product before cutoff optics. You'll see light going off into the woods out behind the luminaire. However, if that was a neighbor's property, they would not be very pleased. So I can go through and use different optics with a strong backlight control. And as you can see, I can completely eliminate any light from going back behind that pole. Again, this is essential in areas where light trespass is a concern, such as adjoining property lines or in areas where you're up against a, um, uh, a, a room where someone's going to be sleeping that night. Now, there's other ways the controls can play into this. If this is a site, you'll see that right now it's late at night, there's no cars in the lot, and yet the entire site is lit at 100% output. There's a number of ways you could control this. You could, for example, dim down the areas that are in the more distant or remote lots. Something like this, so you could focus the attention right into the immediate surrounds. So as people do come in at late at night, they would have a location to park closer to the building. Another possibility is to rely on occupancy sensing. In that case, the entire site would be dimmed down to a lower level, but local light levels would be increased as occupants were present in that space. Now let's start looking at a couple of products real quick. The, uh, when you're talking about design considerations for healthcare, one of the ones that is used the most right now is the D-Series. The D-Series is the perfect product for healthcare projects. It has three different family sizes. You've got the DSX size zero, which goes up to a 400 watt replacement. The size one, which goes up even higher, even to a 750 watt equivalent. And then a 1000 watt metal halide replacement, which is going to be the DSX2. Now, the D series is not just a, a family of standalone products, it is part of a, the largest family of LED products in the industry today. You've got the three different area sizes that I mentioned size 0, 1, and 2. It has two different sized wall units, size zero, uh, 1 and size 2, three different floodlights, size 1, 2, and 3. You have a parking garage luminaire as well as a pedestrian bollard. All of these are part of the same family, bringing a cohesive style and shape to your facility so that it all looks cohesive and really part of the same, uh, same space. Now, the D-Series family has a number of common elements or common attributes I wanted to review. First of all is going to be photometric performance. What you'll see is that precision lenses can direct 100% of the light to the target areas. So this is going to be a key element, and I'll talk about a few of these distributions in just a minute. Longevity we have talked about. In many cases, you have expected service life with lumen maintenance is up to L99 or at 100,000 hours. But even at our higher lumen packages, you're looking at at least L91 at 100,000 hours. That's 22 and a half years. You're looking at efficiency. LED efficiency has always been one of its uh, mainstays with very, very high levels of lumens per watt. And then again, the aesthetics. And this talks about not just the day form aesthetics because people will be visiting the, host, the hospital both at day and at night. So the day form is also important. Now to look at the different lighting distributions, you have a couple of options. These are just some that we've got available with the D-Series family. We have a Type 2 short, Type 2 medium, Type 3 short, Type 3 medium. We have a Type 1 short, Type 4 medium, Type forward throw medium. And then we have our Type 5 distributions, Type 5 very short, Type 5 short, Type 5 medium, and Type 5 wide. Altogether, these give you a tremendous palette of different types of distributions to use to make sure that the light is going exactly where you want it to go and not go where you don't want it to go. And following that theme of eliminating light where you don't want it to go, here's an example of our standard house side shield. This is a shield that can be applied to the luminaires 
at any time, and it will essentially cut off all backlight going behind the luminaire to eliminate any type of light trespass onto adjoining properties. Now, what I wanted to do is give you just some overviews of some other facilities that have gone through and taken advantage of this LED retrofit. First of all, here I have the Carilion Memorial Hospital. This is the site that they had before. This is all illuminated with high pressure sodium. And you can notice not only the amber yellowish color, but also the very, very dark shadows in between many of these areas. Right after they did that lighting retrofit, this is what the site looked like. Obviously, it is vastly improved, but we even were able to interview some of the folks, and you can see some of their comments there, uh, such as a the lighting parking lot fixture was the highest ranking product or tied for highest in every category. Uh, another one said uh, more talking about the actual light in the space. It's very uniform and eliminates the shadows and hot spots. These are going to be common trends as we start looking at some other facilities. The next facility I wanted to look at is the Day Kimball Hospital. Day Kimball Hospital, all I have are the shots afterwards, but you can see how uniform that lighting is. No matter where you are in the parking lot or the apron or the approach to the building, you have all of the areas where you're supposed to be walking very well illuminated to help guide you exactly where you need to go. Here's another photograph of that same hospital. Uh, some of the other interior areas, again, very, very well illuminated. As they said, the uh, change is dramatic. Uh, went from a dingy underwater feeling with a high pressure sodium to a nice, clean, crisp, comfortable light. Other photographs of that same uh, hospital, I've got one more set here, and that is uh, the view of that main front row of their parking lot and just some of the comments that we can hear. As you can see, they're very, very pleased with the results after doing the retrofit. Now, another hospital that we had some changes to was the St. Margaret Hospital. St. Margaret Hospital had individual metal halide luminaires that they found the uniformity to be so poor in that they had to addition, or add additional luminaires to the poles by strapping them on these floodlights and tried to use that to fill in the gaps. Well, all of that was replaced with two very, very clean-looking luminaires, and that more than covers the amount of light in that space. So some of the comments that they made on their site was that they liked the wider, cleaner light of the wider lighting footprint. Uh, talking a little bit more about the better line of sight, which makes them feel more secure. Again, it's important to make sure that people are not worried about their own safety and security in these spaces. Another example is the Humility of Mary Health Partners. This is another site that had a number of uh, light, lighting retrofit areas. The first photograph here is their before shot. Again, they were using high-pressure sodium luminaires. There's a lot of shadows in the space. And um, they were talking about overall, it is important for them to have that feeling of safety. Once we did the relight, it looked like this obviously a dramatic improvement in both the way that it looks and feels. Here's a couple of their comments from the humility of Mary Health Partners. Uh, talking about it creates a greater sense of security. Um, it's important for that environment. You have patients and families, they have their own concerns when they visit the emergency room. Uh, we've kind of talked about that earlier. Uh, talking about how they want visitors to have plenty of light so they feel safe using not just the parking deck, but also the parking lot anytime after dark. So this is the facility after the relight. You can see just what kind of improvement they found. And one of the last case studies I wanted to show you is going to be the Tishman Speyer facility here. On the left, you can see what it looked like before, and on the right, you can see what it looked like after the lighting retrofit. It went from kind of a, a dull, foggy color to a little bit more bright, much more aesthetic, and much more inviting environment. Some of their comments, again, the initial intent might have been to reduce energy costs, but the more important benefit is the improved nighttime appearance of the campus. Uh, talking more about you know, energy efficiency goes more than just energy conservation. It's also economic efficiencies due to the maintenance reductions. 
So there's a huge number of factors that are at play here. So to kind of flow through, um, this is just a real quick um, history lesson, a one slide history lesson, where you'll see the history of our D-Series product. Over the course of only seven years, we have gone through and dropped the weight of that product down to a third of what it was. The wattage has been dropped nearly in half. The lumens have been increased. The lumen maintenance is almost um, unbeatable at this point. And we're able to reduce the LEDs, which allow us to reduce the overall cost. These are all important elements, and you have to maintain a luminaire that is going to be continually updated so that you're always on the current trends. Here's another family, though. Again, I, I've talked a lot about the D-Series, but I'm not going to only limit to that. We have many other products. The KAX is a family of products that has a lot of very unique features, such as tiltable and field rotatable luminaires, very, very high concentration of optics. We also have the Contour Series. This is our CSX family. Again, small, large, and a wall mount unit. In addition to those, we also have a rounded family called the Omero family. These have a number of different options, including a post top, which is very, very attractive up close to the building. And then lastly, we have a number of architectural sconces. These are going to be building mounted units, which enable a great amount of light up around the building and yet still maintaining a very architectural look. So to wrap this up, I just wanted to leave you with just two things. These are the two things that you should remember. Healthcare campuses have very diverse and very unique requirements. And because of that, you need to work with somebody who has the knowledge, the experience, and the product solutions to help you deliver effective outdoor lighting across your entire campus. So what I'd like to do now is wrap up by First of all, saying thank you for your time and attention. There is one more poll question for those of you that want the certification, and that is, would you like one of our experts to help you with your next outdoor lighting upgrade? If you could just select yes, please, or no thanks, that will finish up that one. And I would like to personally thank you all for your time and attention. And we do have a couple of minutes for any additional questions that you may have. If you do have questions, go ahead and enter them into the Q&A window, and we'll try and address one or two perhaps before time's up. Well, Eric, you must have done a phenomenal job. I think you did. Um, there are no questions asked right now, so I think that you were very methodical in covering the material. But we'll leave the line open here for just a minute See if anybody comes up with a question that you want to ask. Uh, if you come up with a question after we close, you are always free to email us with that question. Um, and and uh, Eric's email address is actually in the bio information for this webinar. So um, if you think of something after we disconnect, please do email a question. I also want to remind you to please take the survey and give us your honest input on the webinar. And finally, you're able through the console to actually print out your certificate of completion. So we'll leave the webinar open for a bit so you can do that. And with that, I'm not seeing any questions. So thank you, Eric, and thank you to all of our attendees. Uh, and watch for the next webinar in our series. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you.